eat the discussion. And I'm seeing the participant number tick up. So we're going to give it another minute and then we'll um, we'll get going in just a bit. Well, thanks once again for joining us here today. We've got a, actually several hundred participants and uh, folks are still join, joining, but um, given all of, uh, all of the leaders and the big thinkers we have in discussion today, Chuck, um, let's, let's get underway. My name is Wade Crowfoot and I serve as our California Natural Resources Secretary. And you are here with us to discuss something both important and really inspiring, and that is building connectivity for our animals in California amidst climate change and so many other stressors. My partner in crime today is Chuck Bonham, who leads our Department of Fish and Wildlife at the state, and who's really spent his career as an environmental lawyer working to build connections for habitat for all types of animals. Chuck, good to see you. Let's do this, Wade. <laughs> Well, I know um, I recognize your, uh, your office there uh, in Berkeley, and I'm actually in Los Angeles today. We just finished a press conference with water agencies here, making the case for Angelinos to shift their landscapes to native plants, um, re remove those water thirsty uh, lawns, oftentimes that only get walked on to mow for native plants. And I'll tell you something interesting, um, here at Theodore Payne Garden, which is a native botanic garden. And they explained their vision, Chuck, is to create essentially enough native plants in the San Fernando Valley to create an air bridge, a sky bridge for pollinators and birds from the Verdugo Mountains where we are across the valley to the Santa Monica Mountains. So uh, habitat connectivity finds us in all conversations. It shows up everywhere. And, you know, some of us may struggle with connectivity on the Zoom platform here over the course of the next hour and a half. But it's very true in drought that connectivity matters as well. You think about all those critters that live in water. One of their climate resiliency strategies is to always be able to try to move and find cold, clean water. The same is true for animals out in the desert that survive on wetlands. Their ability to move between habitats in the face of climate change is a core species adaptation strategy. Totally. Now, you've been Fish and Wildlife Director for a decade, about a decade, and some may not know that you worked for Trout Unlimited before serving in state government. And my recollection is that you were working on these issues at TU. So can you talk a bit a little about what your, what your background is on this, these topics? Yeah, I just turned 25. So I've put a lot in, no, joking. Um, so before I got to state service, I was at Trout Unlimited, which is the nation's oldest kind of salmon trout conservation group. And I really began to think about this idea of connectivity up on the north coast of California, say between San Francisco and all the way up to Eureka. At the time, we were doing partnership projects with a new generation of timber companies that had taken over landscape from you know, earlier companies think Mendocino Redwood. And they were in the process of assessing all these legacy forest roads and thinking about how we could repair culverts and bridges and increase the ability for coho and salmon when they come into these coastal streams to make it up into the headwaters that they now own. And we came up with this idea at Trout Unlimited at the time called Protect, protect the last best places, reconnect those places, and then restore the landscape and do it as one big community. And I've always been thinking about this reconnect dynamic. In 2008 at the time, I remember when Patagonia, the outdoor apparel uh, kind of equipment company for that year came up with its campaign, which was freedom to roam. And I was just thinking about that over the weekend. When you say the phrase freedom to roam, 
it, it does make a connection in our hearts and our minds. And that's really the spirit of this wildlife connectivity. And for me, the pinnacle of what I've been working on over this arc is what might be the nation's biggest river restoration project, removing four obsolete dams in the Klamath River, which when we get it done, and Wade, we're gonna put you there to cut the ribbon as secretary to get it done. Salmon and steelhead are gonna be able to access at least 400 miles of river habitat that they haven't been able to access for almost a hundred years. That's connectivity. And that's inspiring. And we're gonna unpack a lot of those issues here today. And to help us, we have some remarkable leaders. We're going to, we have Dr. Sandy Jacobson from Caltrout, who's doing important connectivity work for aquatic or water-based species in Southern California. We've got Beth Pratt, uh, who many know as the person that just would not take no for an answer in developing the world's largest wildlife crossing for land-based animals. Um, we are joined by Matt Strickler, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Fish and Wildlife and Parks at the U.S. Department of Interior. So Matt is a key leader in Washington, D.C., and he'll explain some significant momentum uh, at, within the federal government to address habitat connectivity. And then one of our colleagues, Heidi Calvert, who's an Environmental Program Manager at Fish and Wildlife, will talk about institutionalizing the work uh, in state government. But, and I should say, at the, toward the very end, we have a very special guest, possibly one of the most important leaders in the state on this question of habitat connectivity, but I don't want to create a spoiler alert, so we'll wait a yep. little bit later uh, for that. Yep. But let me first, we're going to start out with uh, Fraser Schilling. For those of you who have been in the habitat connectivity movement for a very long time, you know Fraser as one of the leading voices to explain that we need to do more to protect our animals and connectivity. And the failure to do so uh, is killing a whole lot of life in it across the state. So um, Dr. Schilling actually came and found me shortly after I, I took office to really make the case for the investments in habitat connectivity that we're, we're starting to make. And so Chuck and I asked uh, Frazier to really level set us here today with what we're talking about regarding habitat connectivity across California and really what's the challenge we face uh, connecting habitats. So welcome, Fraser. Thanks I wanted much. to just ask you if you could just start us off, you know, you, you have some, so the UC Davis Road Ecology Center that you lead has some of the best and sometimes the only data on, uh, you know, casualties from uh, transportation and other infrastructure. But if you would, you know, we're joined in, in this discussion by several hundred people, probably some PhDs like yourself on these topics and others that are tuning in for the first time. So if you could kind of level set this discussion around what we're facing in California. Yeah, so I have some slides to help with that or I can verbalize it. Uh, oh, looks like I'm going to have some slides. Uh, so let's just get started with that. There we go. Uh, so I'll talk Frazier, about and if I could just mention for those who are, are joining us, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And so we're gonna hear some um, high level thoughts from the folks I mentioned, and then we're gonna open it up for a group discussion. And I'm gonna be, and Chuck will be uh, providing information or providing these questions to the panelists. So if you, if you, have, it, if you have a question or a thought, um, please do uh, put that in the Q&A and, and we're gonna integrate that into the conversation. Sorry, sorry about that, Fraser. Oh, no problem. And that's a great reminder that I'm gonna be talking at a, at a fairly high level and so if anybody wants to deep dive, we, are, you know, we can absolutely do that. So as I mentioned, I work at uh, UC Davis with the Road Ecology Center that I direct. I also work part-time with DUDEC, a great consulting firm. And if I could get the next slide. So roads and our human activities are all over the landscape. And this is something that we know, we experience it day to day. We take advantage of it when we drive, but we also are using the land in a way that we don't always see. Uh, for example, clear cutting and other kinds of logging uh, for wildfire control, there's, there's logging that takes place. And all of those have a habitat fragmentation impact. In other words, they prevent wildlife from connecting with each other. And then uh, normal subdivision or urban development here, there's a picture here in the middle. Uh, this shows a map of light uh, around Temecula and I-15 in Southern California. And the little red dots are mountain lines that have had GPS collars put on them moving around. And you can see that they stay in the dark areas 
And so as we, as we put more light in the landscape, we're actually compressing the area available to a lot of wildlife to move around. And then if we look at the whole landscape of California, uh, the top right map there, that's showing road density. And we usually think of roads as something that's convenient, you know, to go to the mall, to go to work, to drive to another city. And we can see that in a map of California that a lot of those roads are around cities where we don't have a lot of wildlife. But you can also see the red areas on the map there are areas that we think of wild areas. We think of them as habitat. And those areas have a lot of roads, which uh, Chuck mentioned earlier, uh, trying to remediate those for the benefit of salmon and trout. But they are all over the landscape in our forested habitat areas and some of our desert areas. And so these are all barriers to uh, wildlife movement. Next slide, please. One of the big consequences of that, this is certainly not the only consequence, is that when wildlife move around to meet their day-to-day -day needs, they encounter roads, they encounter traffic. Sometimes they don't try to cross because it's you know, kind of a no-go area, but quite often they do try to cross and this is what happens. And we we hear about this you know, from our work at the Road Ecology Center. Uh, you can see it for yourself when you drive on any road near wildlife habitat, eventually you'll see a road killed animal. And this can be really devastating to uh, certain populations of wildlife. Uh, so mountain lions, for example, one of the big threats to them in the coast range in Southern California and the Bay Area is from stripes on especially state highways where there's a lot of uh, traffic. Next slide, please. So this, this series of maps here are a little complicated and that's because our development activities in California are so complicated. So the one on the bottom left, this shows all of the roads in California. This is a map generated by the State Water Board. It's the best map we have of roads in California. And in some areas of the state, you can't even see the landscape anymore uh, because they, I couldn't make the black lines thin enough on the map that you could see the, the landscape in between. But you can see that we have big wild areas. For example, in the Sierra Nevada, in the desert areas that we have very few paved roads or unpaved roads, dirt roads. But in a lot of the state, we have a lot of road development. In the middle map, this is the uh, over 100,000 uh, water extraction, uh, permanent water extractions we have in California. Every time we pull water from a, uh, from a surface water source, we are uh, depriving water uh, from the stream for aquatic animals to connect. And so it's kind of like the roads, uh, another road effect, but uh, on, on aquatic animals. It has a fragmenting effect as well. But on the far right shows a type of opportunity that's really interesting uh, that we don't know a lot about. In California, there's over 30,000 bridges across streams and rivers. And each of those provides a potential way for wildlife to go through from one area of habitat to another uh, through what we can think of as our existing wildlife crossing infrastructure. However, we don't know a lot about them. And so we don't know how much wildlife are using them, but it gives us a, a way to think about the future wildlife connectivity in California. Next slide, please. And wildlife crossings really work. Uh, the bottom left there, that's actually a drainage culvert a bobcat is walking through. It's relatively small. It's 350 feet long. It goes under Interstate 80 and lots of animals use it. Use it sorry. The one on the, on the bottom right, that short video, that's a structure built for wildlife under State Route uh, US 50, and it shows lots of animals going back and forth through. So a lot of our existing structures and ones that we build for wildlife they very effectively move wildlife back and forth under the roads. The problem is, is that we don't build that many of them in California currently. Uh, we need probably thousands of them and we've built dozens of them. So it's really an area that we can do a lot of improvement, especially when we think about climate change because animals, whether they're terrestrial or aquatic, they need to be able to move due to climate change impacts. Next slide, please. And there's lots of ways that we can work on this. We can work on this together. Uh, the California Roadkill Observation System, it's the largest system of its kind in the US. It used to be the largest in the world, but <laughs> we got taken over. Uh, so we need to collect data. If you wanna collect data, you can point your smartphone at that QR code and it'll take you to the website, or you can just search California Roadkill and, and help us collect data. We have a lot of different people collecting data. And then on the right-hand side, this shows a map of those data. Uh, when we think of the cost of the collisions. So when, a, when somebody collides with a deer on an interstate or state highway and they're going fast, it can result in injury, it can result in property damage. We can estimate the cost for every mile of highway. And it's a way for us to make an economic case 
for why we should repair some of this disconnectivity that we've put into the uh, state's wildlife habitat. Next slide, please. And we finally, and this is something that others are going to touch on, we're going to ha we have a new world of wildlife processing design and construction. Um, on the bottom left, this is a, uh, some work we did at the Road Ecology Center helping improve the Liberty Canyon, now known as the Wallace Annenberg Wildlife River Crossing in Southern California that Beth Pratt's going to talk about, where we looked at light and noise uh, effects around the wildlife crossing and how we can improve the ability of wildlife to actually find the crossing. And then on the top right, this is an innovative type of design from Contech. Uh, I'm, I'm sure other companies do this too, where you can pre-cast wildlife crossings and basically drop them wherever you can, uh, wherever you think they should go. Uh, with this pre-casting approach is a really innovative and new way to have a lot of wildlife crossings all over the state. Next slide, please. So I just want to close, and I should have acknowledged Winston Vickers for this great video at the beginning uh, from UC Davis, and invite anybody to. Uh, contact me directly or ask us questions during the panel. We're all happy to, to help um, everybody understand more about wildlife connectivity. Thank you. Thank you, Fraser. Really helpful to give everyone an understanding of the challenge we face. Question, just a quick follow-up question for you. You know, you've been working on this for a very long time and are an authority. Are you getting a sense that there's a growing awareness of the opportunities that exist to connect habitat via climate change? Or what's this discussion like even outside of California? Oh, great, yeah. Um, and within, well, within California, there's a whole new crop of new uh, biologists and environmental scientists at Caltrans uh, and other agencies, and they are excited about doing this. They need the permission, they need the funding, uh, they need someone to tell them to do it, but there's, but there's a whole new wave of people within the agencies who are excited to do it. And of course, there's those of us on, in academia and NGOs who've been encouraging this for a while, uh, I would say over the last 10 years, there's been a huge tidal wave of, of, of new interests, new funding, et cetera. So I think it's a, it's a game changer. I think it's wonderful. And it is reflected in other states. This is a US-wide movement. It's definitely a global movement. Uh, and we are definitely in the middle of, uh, you know, of the mix in terms of improving wildlife connectivity around the world. And people love this. Wait, back in November of 2019, which pre-COVID we often forget about, <laughs> Frazier actually was a host for something called the International Conference on Ecology and Transportation, which was held in Sacramento. It was the 10th biennial. It had 600 participants from 44 states and 19 countries. People love themselves some wildlife connectivity. It's across the globe. It's a movement. We're bringing it live here to California. So sure with that, great cheerleader, thank you. <laughs> yes, well, we're supposed to drive up the energy. Mark <laughs> gave us the admonishment. We got to keep 300 people excited for an hour and a half. So for the next slice of excitement, let's take a tour to one of the most urbanized uh, spots in California, arguably on the globe, maybe outside Mumbai, India. Beth is going to talk about predators, but let's first go to Dr. Sandy Jacobson, who's with California Trout. I think she's the director for their South Coast program. So she runs offices in San Diego, Ventura, and uh, Sandy, I was just looking at the Orange County Register, which has you as one of the top 125 most influential people in the county. So turning it over to you, tell us about fish and connectivity in one of the most urbanized spots on the planet. Thank you, Director Bonham. Uh, it is indeed, it's a pleasure to talk to everybody today about aquatic corridors. You know, it is, uh, especially for steelhead and other aquatic species, it is about the, the freedom to roam. Uh, building on what Fraser described for land-based wildlife corridors, I'm gonna switch over to aquatic corridors, such as rivers and streams, which are essential for native fish and other species to survive. So as I'm focusing today on uh, endangered Southern steelhead and those rivers that are prioritized for recovery in Southern California, it really extends throughout the state. And I wanna just give a shout out to everybody that's working on connectivity and fish passage um, throughout the state in uh, federal, state, local organizations, uh, nonprofits. It's really, um, it's evolving as uh, solving one of the prime threats to uh, how species become endangered. And so to provide passage to them is really important. So in terms of steelhead, 
So what you're seeing here is one of the barriers in Orange County. And what we've come to realize uh, over the last uh, several decades, 100 years, is that connectivity really is essential um, because steelhead migrate between the ocean and the freshwater spawning and rearing areas where they um, typically reside in upper watersheds. So when their passage is blocked, is what you're seeing here uh, underneath the I-5 in San Juan Capistrano, it essentially short circuits their life history and their population plummets. And this is because they can't effectively reproduce or interbreed. So this started happening in about the mid 1900s when dams, diversions and bridges were built to accommodate the growing population in Southern California. So now at 20 million and in the 21st century, we're finally realizing kind of the ecological damage that some of these structures are, um, are impacting us. So even though Southern Steelhead has been listed for uh, as federally and endangered for since 1997, they still remain under threat and extinction within the next 25 to 50 years. So there used to be runs of uh, tens of thousands in our Southern California rivers, and now they're down to estimated less than 500. But now we have the collective will, the tools and the funding to actually make a difference and to make removal of these key barriers a reality. So I'm going to show you three examples of different sorts of fish passage barriers and their solutions. And but I guess one of the takeaway messages is that although these are big projects, they require a lot of partners. It's now just a matter of years, not decades, to resolve the key ones. And the remarkable thing also that we found is that these structures um, that cause these problems are now actually part of the solution. These fish passage projects are becoming more community-based to improve the infrastructure, to increase the wildlife movement, to improve water quality, to reduce erosion, and to provide sediment transport for, for beach nourishment. So it also provides public safety and enjoyment. So you're gonna see that in the last couple of slides, especially with the, the dam removal. Given the complexity of these, uh, it takes coalitions and many partners to commit to remediating these aquatic barriers. But what we recognize is that the actions that restore the, the wildlife connectivity, they actually restore the watersheds too, to benefit uh, fish, water, and people. So focusing here, I'm just gonna spend just a few moments going through several of the larger barriers that I selected to illustrate. So this is the I-5 barrier in San Juan Capistrano in Orange County. It's right in the heart of it. It's a part of a recreational area, uh, but Tribuco Creek, is one of the main tributaries in the San Juan Creek watershed, which is a high priority steelhead recovery river as cited in the, um, in the federal recovery plan from 2012. This barrier remediation project is probably one of the most complex ones in California, <laughs> not at, at least in Southern California. Uh, and it's all about engineering. So it, it's taken a team of hydraulic engineers, geotechnical engineers, civil and structural, to really come together to identify what that passage is gonna be. So the barrier is about five miles away from the ocean and it's about a quarter mile long and it runs under a array of, uh, of five bridges. So remediation of this barrier uh, and the Metrolink barrier combined, which is about a half a mile downstream, will uh, restore steelhead access to about 15 miles of habitat in the uh, upper watershed. And what I'm gonna show you is a, an animation of how, as if you were a steelhead and you were trying to migrate through this, how you would do that. And so we've taken the bridges off and, um, and you can actually start the animation now to actually show that we're gonna start at the very bottom of this fish passage solution. It's a fishway, it's on one side of, um, one side of the stream right here. So what you're seeing is migrating up over the purple, over those notches, the flood control channel, which is concrete, is going to stay and it's on the left. So the steelhead come up, they come to the top, they bypass this concrete structure, which is an energy dissipator for the flashy stream. They come in, they hang a left, they get to rest just a little bit. These are about 600 foot long um, uh, stretches that they have to navigate. And now they come into these angled fish ba uh, baffles, which are a low point within the, the one bay of the flood control channel itself. So this retains the integrity and the public safety of the flood control that is really important to Orange County flood, uh, flood Control District, but it also provides passage of this really long 
um, through this really long barrier. And so in, in the next slide, we're gonna move, uh, I'm gonna show you the ESA, the federal listing area to give you a little bit more context of the three remaining barriers I'm going to talk about. What you see on the upper left is, uh, well, the whole thing is the ESA listing area in the, for the Southern uh, California Steelhead DPS, the distinct population segment. So what it does is it comes down from Santa Barbara, down through Los Angeles County, Orange County, where I just showed you the I-5 and Metrolink Tribuco barriers, and then down into San Diego. So now we're gonna pop south a little bit into Santa Margarita River in Northern San Diego County. And what you can see on the next slide is the Santa Margarita River watershed. So this, uh, this also, this is one of the free, the only free flowing rivers perennially running in Southern California. So on the lower part here is the uh, Camp Pendleton, they own most of the land down here. And as you migrate up to the top, you see the Sandia Creek Drive barrier, which I'm gonna tell you about. And then the, the river goes into this uh, remarkable gorge area. And that star is where Fraser was talking about. That is the I-15 corridor. So we actually have a confluence of both a steelhead barrier or a steelhead target. It's where we want the steelhead to get, but it's also under that freeway is a, is a mountain lion um, barrier. So as the steelhead's coming up, Camp Pendleton uh, resolved their uh, barrier at a, an inflatable dam that they use for groundwater recharge. They remediated that in 2018, leaving Sandia Creek Drive as the only barrier. And you can see 29 miles inland, this beautiful uh, gorge area of freshwater where they can spawn and rear. So this is only, uh, since it's only about 30 miles inland, they, it's easily a day's swim. And this bridge replacement, uh, what we're going to uh, remediate this barrier with is in the $18 million range. And it is now grant funded to start construction uh, in this year, in fall of 2022, as uh, Caltrout is leading that and is working with San Diego County, County on that. And to acknowledge our funders here, it was really, uh, it was amazing to put this package together from uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Wildlife Conservation Board, California Natural Resources Agency, and the Coastal Conservancy. So next slide, please. So this is Sandia Creek Drive Bridge. So this is a total fish passage barrier. It's in the middle of this wildlife corridor between the Santa Ana Mountains and the Palomar Mountains. And it's also adjacent to a recreational area. It's 18 miles of, uh, of trails that sees over 100,000 visitors per year. The Wildlands Conservancy uh, owns this uh, property and manages it. And it is just a jewel of Southern California. But what's really incredible about this particular uh, fish passage project is that we're going to actually remove this barrier and then replace it with a steel bridge about 160 feet downstream. So this will remain open during construction. But what this multi-benefit project does is in addition to removing a total fish passage barrier and opening up 12 miles of habitat for these fish, it protects the public from flood impacts. What you see on the lower right is as this uh, crossing at, during large storms, it overtops. And I have watched on video people making that decision whether to cross that river or not. It's super flashy. And uh, a lot of times it will happen at night. So this bridge replacement project will improve the safety, not only for automobiles, but also trail users. It alleviates traffic congestion. It brings uh, money into the economy of over 150 local jobs, in addition to, in addition to what we're talking about today of enhancing a key wildlife corridor. Next slide. And what you can see here is just a uh, uh, rendition by our engineering firm, KPFF, on how this bridge is going to look. So you see an aerial view here. This is Sandia Creek Drive on the upper left. The Santa Margarita Trail Preserve is on the, uh, on the further left there. You can see there's at the top, there's kind of this S curve. It's a blind curve. It's really dangerous for pedestrians and horses. So what you can see in the lower is the, the rendition of or like a 3D interpretation of what that bridge is going to look like. We're in final design and it straightens out that curve. It brings it across the river. You can see how it un the the current crossing really has sort of it, it traps the river in a particular configuration and this talking about freedom to roam that's exactly what this river is now going to have a chance to do so it'll come underneath um, this uh, 574 foot steel bridge in three sections and two piers and it's designed to pass a hundred year flow next next slide please 
And so the last two that I want to point out are the two elephants in the room basically down here. So one is Ringe Dam on the left, that's in Malibu uh, Canyon um, and uh, in Los Angeles County. And then on the right, Matillaha, which is in the Ventura River Watershed, and that is owned by uh, the Ventura Watershed Protection District. So just to, it's almost like you don't need to say anything when you see these things. Uh, it kind of understates the fact that they are total fish passage barriers, but they, they actually, they impact the ecology of these rivers and just our experience of nature in so many different ways. So on the left with Ringe, that's a hundred foot concrete structure. It was built in 25 or 1926 by the Ringe family, basically for irrigation, kind of domestic water use. And within several dec decades, it had totally filled with sediment. It's not, it's, it's just obsolete as is Matillaha. And so the desire to bring this down has been, uh, has, has been the subject of advocacy from a lot of different groups for many years. So what I want to say is that you know, although these are many decades long, we are now at a position at both of these where they are within years of, of coming down. So uh, the Army Corps for Ringe, they just finished their uh, feasibility study that's been signed off by the general and now is in Congress. And that this is now ready to go into the, uh, the design phase, basically. So uh, funding for state parks is the owner. It's in the middle of Malibu State Park, a beautiful area. And that uh, they are, we are now able, Caltrout is working with state parks to actually help um, remove, at least do the, uh, accomplish the final design that will lead to implementation, uh, which in large part is sediment transport um, that of the 780,000 cubic yards of uh, sediment that have accumulated behind this, this particular dam. So implementation is about eight, eight to 10 years. And then in Matillaha, the famous scissors that you can see um, that, uh, you know, I think, you know, Surfrider, Patagonia, Caltrout, so many different uh, organizations have been, uh, have been part of this. And to, it's got a little different strategy uh, for doing downstream projects like the Santa Ana Bridge, which is near completion now and the levees, but that also like the orifice construction will help to remove the sediment and move that downstream. So basically all of what I've shown you, different, uh, different types of structures, different types of barriers, but all with the same goal of connecting and, and, uh, and reestablishing connectivity to historic spawning and rearing habitat. Hey, so uh, Sandy, awesome work inspirational. Just this February, our Wildlife Conservation Board approved the $12.5 million grant in the current budget signed by the governor to state parks to do all the 90% final feasibility on Ringe. Each of these projects is about modernization and they're having all kinds of benefits in addition to wildlife connectivity. So from there, Wade, over to you. I know we've got another kind of uh, run through a Southern California project and then we'll come back for more. Yes, absolutely. Well, we've been talking about river-based or water-based or aquatic connectivity with Dr. Jacobson. Let's turn it over to my colleague and friend, Beth Pratt. Beth leads efforts at the National Wildlife Federation to create what might be the most galvanizing land-based uh, wildlife bridge on earth. Beth, you've got your construction helmet on. I understand we're pretty close to breaking ground, but but tell us what what have you been up to and why is it so important? Well, first, Secretary Girlfriend, uh, I, I'm honored to call you both a colleague and a friend and a partner. You and Sec and Director Bonham and Governor Newsom and and Director Donnelly, we're going to do this. Uh, this wildlife crossing, uh, the largest in the world at least at this point, I'm sure somebody will try to knock us down <laughs> as home, is about to break ground. And uh, we are announcing the break ground date uh, on Thursday of this week at a public meeting, but hint, hint, just don't make any plans in late April, people, if you want to attend. So, but your partnership and um, I think the leadership around wanting to be 
if not first with wildlife crossings, I think some other states got a little ahead of us, at least leading the way in sort of the next iteration of wildlife crossing. So it's just been such an honor to work with all of you. And thanks for tolerating my never taking no for an answer. <laughs> but happy to talk with all of you. And that's why I do have my construction hat on because I'm a bit dizzy. Uh, I've been working on this project now for 10 years, some of the other partners uh, for much longer. And I do wanna call them out, the National Park Service, the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy, Caltrans, the Resource Conservation District of the Santa Monica Mountains, my own organization, the National Wildlife Federation, and also Living Habitats LLC, who has been working side by side with such an incredible team at Caltrans to design this crossing. Um, if you wanna put James up number 17, um, I just wanna show you what it's gonna look like. These are some amazing, artist visualizations uh, that the Liberty Canyon crossing, what it'll look like. And what you see here is, again, this is where California is leading the way a little bit, um, that this is actually an extinction of the whole ecosystem. So we are reconnecting the Santa Monica Mountains uh, to the rest of the world, really. We didn't know it when we put the 101 in, but wildlife, um, we cut it off from the, the rest of the world. And, and that had a lot of really devastating impacts and that we continue to see play out, especially in terms of the mountain lion. I think the heroes of this tale, or at least the poster cats for why we need to get this done. What we know, and you know, Fraser gave a lot of good data on roadkill. And, and I think some of uh, that is really compelling data on where we need to put crossings, but also a lack of roadkill can be just as telling. And that's what Liberty Cannon really points to is avoidance and that these mountain lions actually more so than trying to cross turn around and they are inbreeding themselves out of existence because they can't get mates outside their family. An important point is that this is not just playing out with mountain lions at the Liberty Canyon site, but also playing out all up and down the food chain. Uh, the National Park Service, who's been doing research in this area, is showing that you know genetic um, fragmentation and, and decline in genetic diversity is, is showing up in birds and Western fence lizards. And we even have the attention to plants, which also need movement for resiliency. So I want what I want to say about why this is such an important project is there's so many superlatives I could give. It's going to be the largest in the world. It's also going to be the only one I can see that's that's designed in actually the impetus is to prevent the extinction of a species. A lot of crossings around the world are built to avoid roadkill, a very worthy cause, but we're doing something a little different here, which is really reconnecting an ecosystem to avoid that genetic isolation for both flora and fauna. Uh, and, and you can see that in the design here, which again, has a fully functioning habitat. Another thing that, that makes this such an important project is the, the urban nature of it. I also cannot find precedent for plopping something like this down in the middle of an urban environment. And I think that makes it special from both a biological perspective. When I was coming up in conservation, we were taught to, to write cities off, right? What, what conservation value did they have? Uh, most of my career has been spent in national parks, uh, Yellowstone, Yosemite. And we were taught to think those places or places like those just pure, you know, preserved open space was all that we should be focusing on. But we now know scientifically that's not correct. We need to connect habitat even across human spaces so that we're doing that. And in one of the most densely populated human spaces in the country and over one of the busiest freeways, I think is such a hopeful thing, but also will inspire others. But what, what I want to end on is to me, the most important part of this, which is the social aspect and that people have gotten involved. And, um, you know, I, and I love this. And if we wanna go to slide um, 20, just to show you some of the urban, you can't put a wildlife crossing in the middle of LA without people being involved because there's people everywhere. The Kardashians live near this site. But we look at how people have rallied around this crossing across the world, and you're going to have 300 to 400,000 cars a day driving under it. It's already inspired other projects. It's already made wildlife crossings more socially acceptable, or at least just gotten the public awareness up so that more projects can go through. 
And I think that that's great that day-to-day people are getting that connected because we are really getting that built, this built. It was a heavy lift, an impossible dream. We're getting it built because of people like Wallace Annenberg who donated and the Wildlife Conservation Board and Governor Newsom and, and Secretary Crawford who put money in here. But we're also getting this built because of the public support. And that gets back to the last slide I'll give you to, which is uh, slide 22, coincidentally, of our boy P-22. People have rallied around these mountain lions and other wildlife because they see firsthand, not just data, but they see firsthand how these roads impact them. Uh, Go to the next slide, which is my favorite photo of P-22, not just the famous one. This is what he faces every day. And I think that this real story captured the imagination of people. And that created a movement. I hope to be out of a job fundraising and advocating for crossings. I hope because of this movement, we're gonna see more and it's just gonna be embedded in planning and budgets. But for now, let's thank our boy P22 for what he's inspired. And my thanks to all of you for being a part of this and can't wait to celebrate with you. That's incredible. And you reminded me that this wildlife crossing will span 10 lanes of Highway 101 and a public access road. So not only is it really wide from the renderings, but it's really long. It, you know, it, it's enormous. Uh, you know, when people ask, what's taken so long? It's actually moved quite, quite rapidly. And to engineer in such an urban area over 10 lanes of traffic and an access road, it just hasn't been done. So yeah, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, and I have to... I have to say, you know, it's so energizing to hear how complimentary you are of the team at Caltrans you've been working with, um, that they have been driving this forward. This is a big, expensive, complicated project that wouldn't be getting done unless there were men and women on the ground actually in our transportation agency driving it forward. So um, really, really exciting with that partnership. So speaking of partnerships, Chuck, over to you. Hey, let me segue to partnerships by just thanking Beth. She reminds us what Albert Einstein told us. Imagination is way more important than intelligence. In the imagination (laughs) of what you've got down there, let's turn to Matt Strickler on the national front. So Matt is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Fish, Wildlife and Parks at the Department of the Interior. He actually was the former Secretary of Natural Resources in Virginia. And Matt, I think you were the chief resilience officer for the state under Governor Northam. So when you think about imagination, when you think about transportation, I know Interior works a lot with uh, Secretary Buttigieg. What's on your mind? What are you seeing nationally? What's your advice to here uh, in California to us? Yeah, well, well, thanks, Chuck, and, uh, and good afternoon, and thanks for the opportunity to, to speak with you today. Um, you know, a lot of interesting um progress and, and work going on uh, on, on this topic. And, and first, just uh, I'd, I'd like to offer my greetings from Secretary Holland uh, from here in Washington, D.C., and uh, say that we are all uh, very excited that it, it's finally springtime. And, and today's uh, discussion is, is both very important uh, and very timely, both because we're in the midst of, as you all know, a, a climate crisis and a biodiversity crisis that are fundamentally altering not just our ecosystems, but also our, our life support systems here on, on planet Earth. Um, so the, the stakes are very high, and, and we know that in addition to reducing carbon emissions as quickly as possible, we really need to focus on doing everything we can to help nature and the people who depend on it survive uh, and adapt. And I'm very fortunate to work for an interior secretary uh, and a president who believe that strongly. And in my job at the department, I oversee two of our country's premier conservation agencies, the National Park Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service. And while those agencies have different missions, um, they both include protection and restoration of wildlife populations and habitat kind of as core objectives. In fact, and and many of y'all might not know this, but 80% of national park lands are managed as, as wilderness. And when you combine that with our 568 national wildlife refuges, state and local conservation lands, private natural area preserves and, and, the lands and waters, all of these make up a network of what I would call biodiversity banks, which are located in every state uh, and territory in in the country. And and California, obviously, uh, is a huge biodiversity hotspot in addition to having just a ton of of acreage. So 
um, a very important place to be having this um, this conversation. And and to the point of of today's forum, one of the challenges we really face is that all of the banks in this network of biodiversity banks aren't connected. Uh, and in reality, they're, they're islands that are surrounded by a sea of other lands and waters that are mostly not managed for conservation uh, and across which we have erected many barriers to fish and wildlife uh, migration. And kind of continue with this banking theme, climate change is eating into our principle. Uh, and in order to reverse this trend and begin accruing interest in the form of more abundant fish uh, and wildlife populations, we need to provide opportunities to connect high quality fish and wildlife habitats and allow species to migrate uh, to places where they can survive and, and thrive, just as, as Chuck was talking about climate refugia earlier. So that's why Secretary Holland's placing such a huge emphasis on corridors and connectivity and crossings and implementing President Biden's bipartisan infrastructure law and the America the Beautiful uh, initiative. The, the bipartisan infrastructure law in particular is, is incredibly exciting. Um, you know, spending in, in this law is, is on a scale on, on fish habitat and, and wildlife habitat and connectivity and crossings that I, I couldn't even imagine before, uh, before it was passed. Um, we're talking just for the Department of the Interior, $400 million for ecosystem restoration grants to states and tribes with an emphasis on cross-boundary projects, 200 million for the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, for removing barriers to fish passage, including uh, deadbeat dams, culverts, et cetera, and $162 million specifically for restoration in the Klamath River, River Basin uh, in Northern California and, uh, and Oregon. So just within the department, we've got a, a ton of resources to put on the ground. And in addition, we're working very closely with our partners at the Department of Transportation, Department of Agriculture and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration as they look to deploy $350 million for wildlife crossings specifically and another $1.5 billion combined for culvert removal and fish passage. So a, a lot of really good stuff going on under the bill uh, and exciting times as we look to get that money on the ground and, and do some of these really important projects. Under America the Beautiful, we're also prioritizing fish and wildlife corridors as we deploy the resources that we have available under the Great American Outdoors Act, the Land and Water Conservation Fund, and other sources. Um, and we're looking to enhance habitat corridors and connectivity as we seek to conserve 30% uh, of America's lands and waters by 2030. And of course, we can't do any of that without great partners. Uh, and California is one of the best. Governor Newsom, Secretary Crowfoot, uh, and Director Bonham have shown incredible leadership on providing a better future for everything from salmon to cougars to desert bighorn sheep. Uh, and of course, being uh, out in front with their own 30 by 30 strategy. So we're committed uh, to working again with our state uh, and tribal and local partners. Um, we're also committed to continuing implementation of secretarial, secretarial order, excuse me, 3362, um, and supporting state priorities on big game migration corridors for species like elk, mule deer, uh, and pronghorn. And this is something that's been really important to uh, states across the political uh, spectrum, uh, particularly in, uh, in the Northern Rocky Mountain states where we don't always see eye to eye on everything, uh, but uh, conservation of iconic wildlife species uh, and habitat connectivity is certainly something that we, we do have in common. So we'll be looking to replicate the success of Secretarial Order 36, 3362, um, through similar habitat connectivity opportunities uh, across the states and, and tribal lands and looking for partnerships for voluntary conservation on private lands um, as well. And the, the one final point that I'll make, and, and I'm sure many of you know this, but wildlife crossings and corridors have significant benefits for humans in addition to what they provide in protecting biodiversity. Reducing vehicle collisions, alleviating flooding, um, opening up new outdoor recreation opportunities are just some of the ways that this work can improve all of our lives. And this is particularly important as we're looking to increase outdoor access for underserved uh, communities and improve climate change uh, resilience. So I'll stop there. Uh, again, appreciate being with you all today and look forward to answering any questions. Matt, that's awesome. And just a huge heartfelt thanks from all of our department scientists for all the park and fish and wildlife service scientists. It's that partnership where they're often doing the assessments of corridor routes, sensitive species, how you might engineer these things. And it's really the partnership that allows us to go to scale. Um, and what I'm 
really thankful you mentioned was your view that kind of playing out in the halls of Congress, this topic of corridor and connectivity is often non, nonpartisan. Forget bipartisan, it's nonpartisan, particularly in the, in the West. And that's a sign, of, that's really hopeful, I think, because we need big funding uh, to get these big projects done. So stay yeah, I tuned totally for agree. and over to you, Wade. Yeah, thanks, Chuck. I, and thanks so much, Matt. Really, really inspiring that we are at this moment when we're all aligned. And I really appreciate your point on the connectivity between those banks for biodiversity. One of the questions in the Q&A is, how does this relate to our 30 by 30 effort, state and federally? And I think we all agree, while we need to restore, conserve more habitat, we need it to be connected, which is really your point. And to the extent that it's disconnected, we're not going to achieve what we need to, to maintain biodiversity, much less expand equitable outdoor access or take, take climate action. So big thanks. We're gonna then take it from DC back to Sacramento and, and ask Heidi Calvert to come on screen. Heidi works with Chuck as the environmental program manager at Fish and Wildlife. And you all are obviously spearheading this effort around wildlife connectivity. So wanted to ask you what is happening at Fish and Wildlife you know, towards um, growing uh, this effort and really institutionalizing it across all the work that you do. Thanks, Secretary. Um, so here at, at California Department of Fish and Wildlife, we have scientists um, who spend their days sort of working on this effort, helping collect data, analyze data, um, connect with partners. That's been sort of a huge theme of this today, um, creating databases, creating maps, um, all to support wildlife connectivity projects and efforts across the state. Um, one of our big efforts that we have is our California Essential Habitat Connectivity Map that was developed in 2010 and updated in 2019. Um, this really uses data that we've collected um, from various sources to really show um, where we can connect habitat that's still available. And then also shows pinch points where there's locations where there's animal movement, but there's features like development, um, or sort of natural funnels and sort of this provides us with something that we can focus on. Um, we're, we're, we're always updating that. We're currently in an effort to update that map. We're also um, developing ungulate migration corridors, something that we can add to that map on a real local level and a regional level, which is sort of the perspective that I'm looking at. When we know there's an issue, whether it's from using this map or um, just from sort of anecdotal knowledge, then we can really um, look at a finer scale and do things like data collection, putting GPS collars on animals, using camera data, and then we can really focus on areas where, um, where we need to improve uh, wildlife connectivity. And so we made a lot of progress in the recent years on wildlife connectivity uh, progress. We've projects that have been already mentioned, but include um, overcrossings, undercrossings, directional fencing, fish passage projects. Some of the um, one of the ones sort of to tell you a story of one of the ones that I'm familiar with, uh, and on Highway 395 in Mono County, we had roadkill data that showed where mule deer were crossing. And we've partnered with Caltrans to look at a wildlife crossing project that we can implement to help, to help with this. And this is one of the projects that Wildlife Conservation Board just funded. And with our support, um, where, where they can look at sort of the development and the planning phase of it, and then hopefully on towards the implementation. But that's been a really good partnership. So where do we focus our priorities? Um, we really look to protect, protect connectivity where habitat is still intact through permanent conservation and adaptive management. And we also look to further avoid fragmentation of habitat, um, things like urban development, um, long linear projects. We also like to minimize or mediate the effects of existing barriers on connectivity. So this is where we can create our wildlife crossings or fish passages. 
Another way all these tools help us is when new projects come in and we can really help with mitigation and show those projects where wildlife are crossing or where wildlife need help um, on some of these projects. So that's a little bit about the work uh, that the California Department of Fish and Wildlife is, is doing. Heidi, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Heidi. Um, obviously, you know, there's, there's so much to unpack uh, in terms of the state and the federal efforts, and we're excited to do so. We're going to move to what I call the Brady Bunch view or the Hollywood Squares view, pick your TV comparison, and bring all of our panelists back uh, on screen. And I think in a little bit, we may be joined by one of our colleagues. Uh, but there's a lot of questions coming in from the Q&A. And uh, we're, boy, we're over 300 people in, in the discussion right now. And if you have a question or an observation or a suggestion, please do click on the Q&A button and, and type it in. Um, there are just some really specific questions I want to run through um, first. Um, one for Beth on the Liberty Canyon project, uh, which is, of course, in greater L.A., is the land on either side protected or what's to prevent the land on either side from getting sucked up and developed and therefore losing the connectivity? That's a really good question. And it is indeed, the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy had the foresight, actually before corridors were even being talked about, really gotta give a lot of credit to Joe Edmondson, Paul Edelman, Roy Skay, that the, the land is protected and they were talking about quarters before anybody was. And I will just say for any wildlife crossing, we know from data and science, to put one in, you need the land protected on either side. You can't just throw the animals down in a target you know, parking lot, <laughs> it won't work. So indeed it's protected and it's gonna stay protected. That's really helpful. Dr. And Chuck, I'll let you jump in here on questions, but Dr. Jacobson, question on the aquatic side. Um, somebody's asking, well, when you, you know, open those dams, will the sediment load be negative on the fish? And then how do you manage temperatures of the fish ladders or sort of the, you know, those, that migration infrastructure? Yeah, thanks. Those are two key points and I can um, address them just sequentially here. So for the dam removal, so the sediment, what they share in common is that they have large amounts of sediment accumulated behind them, but how they're treating that is different. So for Ringe, it's actually a portion of that is going to be trucked around and then deposited near shore uh, near uh, around the Malibu beaches. So this not only provides beach nourishment, but it also um, will help reduce scour and impacts of climate change as far as erosion. So that's, that's one thing. And that's one of the major cost drivers for that dam removal. The other one, so in Matillaha, it's an orifice. And so it's a highly controlled release of sediment. So they're, they're fundamentally different. But what I can tell you is that during, you know, like Army Corps and during the feasibility stage, alternatives are considered where public safety is foremost. And so any flood impacts, changes to water surface elevation, things like that are modeled in sediment transport models and then taken into account accordingly. And in the case of Matillaha, that's why I mentioned that they're doing these four downstream projects to prepare for that. So one is like the Santa Ana Bridge, which has increased elevation, improved levees to handle the different water surface elevation as these changes happen. There will be a transient impact on fish or other uh, wildlife, um, aquatic species, but this is expected to, to reset the channel and actually overall yield a lot of environmental and ecological benefit. Yep. So that's one thing. So, and then just to quickly touch on the temperature again, um, you know, steelhead are just, they're remarkable. They only travel predominantly during certain times. And so these are really flashy systems in Southern California. So as the water comes up, that hydrograph looks like a bell curve, but it's really condensed over about 72 hours. And so they travel during that time. And so as the water is coming up, the, the fishways and the transport channel is designed so it only handles so much during these flashy flows, the rest of it and all the other like sediment and junk that's coming down the river goes down a different channel. And so they have clear passage up there. And so the water temperature, it's really only going to be over a period of maybe 72 hours when those fish are traveling. And so the water temperature at that time is not an issue. And it's also during the winter when that happens. Hey, Sandy, you know what? Yeah. On Matilaha too, I remember the connectivity of this project runs beyond just the fish. So the city of Ventura down at the mouth of the river is having an erosion problem with its beaches. 
And an action you take up in the watershed to modernize a dam by removing it yep. is going to restore the beach down in Ventura, which is a tourism, yep. public yep. access and recreation benefit. I encourage everybody in this conversation <laughs> to think about drawing the aperture bigger on these projects because we're finding so many benefits yep. come from modernizing old infrastructure. Frazier, over to you for the Great. next question. I think I know in my mind, pop quiz, what's the stretch of road in California that's most lethal for animals? <laughs> oh, I don't know if you should ask questions like that because it puts people on the spot. Fair but um, since you did, uh, Interstate 280 uh, is consistently the stretch of highway that has the most crashes with larger animals. It has, certainly has the most impact on humans uh, in terms of a biodiversity impact. It may not be the most, it could be US 101 in Marin. But one thing that's pretty true is that a lot of the highways around the Bay Area, because of the great open space conservation work that's been done, there's a lot of wildlife habitat, but there's a lot of traffic. And so those are really the killers uh, when it comes to biodiversity loss are the ones around the highway, around and the Bay those, Area. And so following up on a question that just came in, are those the kinds of things you and scientists in Matt's world and Heidi's world are trying to figure out as the ranking criteria for prioritization? Yeah, you know, it's, it's pretty complicated. So I'll try to simplify it. Number one, um, somebody asked this too, where do wildlife know where the crossings are and how do they know? They really don't. And they also don't know where the corridors in, are that we think are, you know, with, that we put on a map. So wildlife are, are doing their own thing. And so it makes prioritization really difficult. Uh, one of the big ways that wildlife respond to, to our infrastructure is from the noise and light. And this was another question in the, in the uh, Q&A. When they come up to roads, our research has shown that about half of wildlife just stay away from the roads altogether. That means they don't find the crossings at all. So you've got this complex of we can find where the crashes are occurring. That's relatively easy. We can use that to prioritize. But the ecological impacts... Uh, much more difficult. Where are the wildlife not even coming close to the road? When they get there, what do they do? How much are they using the existing infrastructure? We know we have thousands and thousands of bridges. So, you know, how do we balance those? Those are definitely the kinds of criteria, but it, it is a cutting edge research location that you're talking about. Nice. That's helpful. Matt, maybe a question to you. And Michael asks, um, how the Biden administration is working to ensure that federally managed public lands in California can connect and support, you know, to the state projects. So maybe more broadly, since you have the entire U.S. <laughs> under your jurisdiction, how are you thinking with, um, you know, the agencies that that you oversee to really make sure that there are linkages between the management of those public lands and what's happening at the states, whether it's California or Wyoming or Colorado? Yeah, thank you, Wade. It's a it's a great question. Um, and having just come from a from a, a state natural resources um, agency, um, I've got an interesting perspective and in understanding that federal conservation lands are really really important, right? Um, but without the state and local partnerships and and state natural area preserves, state forests, um, wildlife management areas that are you know funded through our excess tax on on, on guns and ammunition, fishing tackle, etc there's no way that we can stitch this all together, right? And have, have, have corridors and habitat and, and connected lands for, um, for, for wildlife to, to thrive and be able to migrate during climate change. So I think there, there are a couple of, of, of aspects here. One is, is we're working very closely across the, the federal family with everybody from the, the US Forest Service to the Bureau of Land Management to the Department of Defense. And of course the agencies that, that are under our purview to, to understand you know, where, where are the hot spots for biodiversity, where are the pinch points for connectivity that we really need to focus on, not just conserving land, um, but as, as Chuck mentioned, restoring the land that's already degraded. And particularly in the eastern states, that's hugely important. We've got big swaths of, of, of forest service land and some wildlife refuges and some other areas that are, you know, that are suitable. But in order for wildlife to be able to really thrive, we've got to do that hard work of restoration. Um, using uh, river corridors is a, is a great way, right? Because you've got a lot of riparian forest in there that you can, you can start with. But no, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge to, to work with our federal partners and then also um, with the states to, to look at their wildlife conservation priorities and, and try to figure out how we can um, kind of stack those things up to, to get to something that uh, you know, the whole is, is bigger than the sum of the parts. 
Well, I have to say it's really, really energizing. And again, to have the alignment gives us a really unique opportunity. So speaking of opportunities, I wanted to introduce uh, our guest to this discussion, Transportation Secretary Tokes Omashakin. Um, for you who don't know Tokes, you soon will. He was recruited by Governor Newsom and team uh, where he was leading transportation efforts in Tennessee and uh, brought out to California and did such a great job as Caltrans director, be careful what you wish for, that he became our transportation secretary. And in this time, we have a true partner in so many ways uh, on ensuring that we're delivering the transportation projects that California needs and in a way that optimizes uh, mitigation and our wildlife benefits. So Chuck, I think it was you who, who maybe first met Tokes and said, oh my gosh, Wade, we got um, we got an we got an incredible partner here, Chuck. Yeah, we won we won the lottery, and uh, I don't know what Wade did to persuade Tokes to join this symposium right now, <laughs> but I want to take the moment and just vouch for Tokes in front of the four hundred people, thousand people who might be watching. Um, he's the real deal. He's been willing to sit down and think about what multi benefit kind of modernization, meeting his needs on 21st century transportation look like with 21st century and forward needs for wildlife in California. And you can look across the state, Santa Cruz, Highway 17, Mount Lyons, State Route 89 going out of Truckee uh, towards our Loyalton deer herd, Liberty Canyon. The study that Heidi was mentioning comes from a 2010 Caltrans and department commission set of experts on essential habitat connectivity. We have a 2018 fish passage priority list, which is jointly done. I think Heidi would tell you her success over on Highway 395 is because she's sitting with Caltrans folks who now see the space and the leadership's window to work on these projects with our department. So huge props to you, Tux. Thanks for joining us. I don't know how many beers Wade promised for joining this afternoon, but sign me up for an additional one when we connect. Can I just, sorry, I have to be part of the fan club too. You've been incredibly supportive for Liberty Cannon, but also as from a national group, we get asked all the time, how are you getting all this cooperation from your DOT? Caltrans rocks and you've been leading that. Thank you. <laughs> Well, Tokes, no pressure now, man. You should, just, you should just hang up and, and leave. But um, we're interested to know because, again, a lot of the folks probably on the, on the, in this discussion are really excited about the environmental aspects of this, but don't know the work that you're involved in that you're leading. So give us a little sense of, of your vision and, and where you think these different priorities converge. Yeah, th 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 thanks so much. So, so when it's time for uh, Secretary Crowfoot, when it's time for me at some point, hopefully to ask Governor Newsom for a raise, I'm just gonna take this uh, montage from Beth, <laughs> you and, and Chuck, and just hand it to him and say, hey, listen to this. Um, anyway, uh, thank, thank you guys so much for that. I appreciate that. Uh, so uh, it's just my, my belief um, that in, in our industry, uh, that we should be looking out as much as we possibly can. We, the, the practitioners in transportation, for 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 people, um, and part of when I say for people, when I say uh, when I say that, part of that means that we're looking out for the wildlife. That's very much a part of how we live as well. That those two things are not separate. Uh, I, I know sometimes people, you know, like to look at those things in different worlds, but the wildlife around us is actually a part of us. Um, and as we continue to try to make our transportation system more robust and grow, um, we need to make sure that we're looking out for the aquatic and the wildlife resources around us as well. This should just be ingrained into how we do our work. I really don't see it as something that's like a special effort. Um, it should just be a part of how we do our business. So as we think about building complete streets, for example, for people to walk and bike and so forth, we should be looking and say, okay, what kind of uh, natural resources or what kind of uh, wildlife uh, resources exist within an area? And it should just be ingrained into how we do our work. It shouldn't be any, we shouldn't get any kudos or any special points 
uh, for just doing what we're supposed to uh, supposed to do because the wildlife around us are a part of us. Uh, it's a part of us, I should say. Um, so I would say in, in this era, in this period where we're about to undertake unprecedented investment in, in infrastructure, like never before. I got a chance to hear uh, uh, Das uh, Strickler, got a chance to hear a little bit of what he was saying there at the end as I was coming on. But as we're about to do that, what better time to make sure that um, even if it's a maintenance project, um, that we're incorporating that. Uh, this infrastructure bill is not focused on building big, giant new highways and freeways. It is not that at all. It's a fix it first approach. But even with a fix it first approach, we can still try to make sure we're incorporating uh, uh, crossings for aquatic resources and wildlife resources as much as possible, despite the fact that there is a set aside. I'm sure you, you maybe you discussed it already. There's a billion dollars uh, in the federal program for uh, for culverts, specifically for removing or rehabbing culverts to improve connectivity for aquatic resources. There's $350 million for uh, a national, which is a drop in a the bucket. Uh, there's much more work to be done. $350 million for uh, wildlife connectivity. Uh, all those sort of measures at the federal level, and I know the efforts and belief is there at stake, but it can't just be those special pots. It needs to be built into how we do our business daily within the infrastructure sector, uh, is what I believe. Well, that's music to our ears and huge thanks. Maybe, you know, we're getting close to the 145 uh, time to end our discussion. And Tokes, your presence here, hopefully for everybody, signifies just the partnerships that we have, that we're building. But Chuck, to you, maybe the tough question to kind of round this out, which is, you know, Frazier pointed out in the beginning, there are a lot of opportunities to reconnect habitat and a lot of need to do that with the existing infrastructure. Tokes' point with new infrastructure or the fix it, you know, the rehabilitation. How, how does the Department of Fish and Wildlife working with Caltrans really prioritize or does, you know, w w will there be a sort of a master plan or a, a list, a prioritized list? And how are we sort of thinking, you know, moving beyond these, you know, really great habitat connectivity projects and you know, building into a sustainable program? It's doable. I think a list is one way to envision that future. We already have a fish priorities list for the whole coast from Oregon down to Baja. We are working on our side, trying to identify, say, our top 10 or 15 kind of wildlife potential projects in the state. We want to interface with Tox's shop and everyone else. And I'll just say, when we get to this brighter future, uh, we're gonna find that nature, she's resilient when we give her a chance. And just think about this. Most of y'all know we've got wolves back in California for the first time. And this is a good news story, even though it ended with a, a mortality. OR93 came to our state recently and in November of last year, passed away in Kern County. Came from Oregon, crossed 80, crossed 395, crossed Highway 99 several times, crossed Interstate 5 several times, got to Ventura County and could see as the crow flies, LA and the lion on, you know, Beth's slides, I'm guessing. That is a remarkable journey by an animal. And now with Toke's leadership and others, we can fit these priorities together, match it with Matt's federal funding and get some stuff done here. Wade, I know you and Tokes would agree, Governor Newsom sees a future like that, which is future-proofing for our infrastructure and benefiting our wildlife. And it keeps me super excited. This is the one topic that's the most exciting one of all I'm doing at the director level for our department, and I enjoy it, because it's a fix it for the better kind of common partnership. Well, well put, and I'm, oh, sorry, Tokes. Oh no, no, no! I, I, I was excited. Uh, Chuck, Chuck is—he's uh, pretty pumped up. I was excited just listening to Chuck. <laughs> oh, totally. Me too. Um, and I was going to say, just emphasized to your talks was was the multi-benefit nature of all this. So, you know, Sandy presented a, a project that demonstrated fish benefits, but also transportation safety benefits. And Chuck pointed out that fish benefits can be, you know, restoration benefits of beaches and. I mean, everyone's made this point about multi-benefit. 
Um, hopefully this hour and 15 minute discussion energized you who are watching. I'll end with a thanks. And that's a thanks to those outside of government represented here today by Frazier and Beth and Sandy. You know, those people who have been making the case for more wildlife connectivity for a very long time. Uh, it's your advocacy, it's your leadership, it's your partnership that's got us to where we're going to go. And big thanks to the folks uh, across our agencies that are getting us uh, to the next level. And that's really where we're going to move. Uh, if you have questions or comments on any of the information that was provided, please do reach out to our email that you're seeing on screen. There will also be a recording of this video on our resources.ca.gov website under the Secretary Speaker Series. Thank you all for your participation, and we're really quite excited to work on uh, building more wildlife connectivity across California. Thanks, Thanks so much, and have a great day, all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.